Welcome to our first episode of VidTao's Video Inception Podcast. This is Ian Naj, co-founder of VidTao YouTube ad library, vidtao.com, and also co-founder of Inceptly.com, YouTube advertising agency, full service, YouTube ad agency scaling brands to 100K a day and beyond, Inceptly.com is our website. But... Let's focus on the important stuff. Today is our first episode and we have Thomas Hopkins. So Thomas Hopkins was the head of growth at masterclass.com 2019 to 2021. He helped grow them from, I think it was 40 million a year in revenue to over $160 million in yearly revenue, basically across every possible paid channel from podcasts to YouTube, obviously, we've all seen their ads, TV, Facebook, et cetera. So Thomas is gonna walk through a couple of things. Well, more than a couple of things. First of all, Thomas is gonna talk about the attribution system that they use to basically look and see across all these different platforms, what's working, what's actually driving sales. So Thomas goes into detail on that, the dashboard that they built and you can experiment with yourself. And then also the YouTube ad formula that has proven so successful for Masterclass. We're not just talking about those marquee, A player, immediately recognizable celebrities that Masterclass has. We're talking about those folks who maybe we don't recognize, but um, they are still the face of very successful masterclass offers. So this formula is very applicable no matter what you're running. It's worth seeing how you can apply to your own offers, your own business and, and testing out for yourself. So he's going to get into that and a bunch of other stuff. So Thomas was also head of growth, passenger growth at Lyft before he joined masterclass. So a ton of experience there. And also now he's a co-founder of a web three gaming company called PerfectStorm.gg. Very interesting stuff there. So we're going to get into Web3 gaming as well on this on this podcast. And um, so we're going to, we also have some notes. We have a basically breakdown of exactly how to apply this masterclass YouTube ad formula to your own ads. So we got a checklist on that, have some more detailed notes on this podcast so you can easily share it with your team and get them to apply the learnings from what Thomas is going to share. So that's all going to be inside of your VidTao YouTube ad library. So there's a se separate section in there for the podcast. So if you haven't already joined, it's free. Go to vidtao.com, join our free YouTube ad library. And you'll also see a section there on the left-hand column for getting some of these podcast resources. So without any further conversation here, Let's dive into our chat with Thomas. Thomas Hopkins, so, so good to have you on, on the call with us here. And uh, yeah, so, I mean, you've been in the, the, mark, the growth game for a long time. And what's interesting is, you know, just can you tell us, like, are, you're from San, San Diego originally. How did you get from yeah. San Diego to, to where you are here? <laughs> um, you know, it's funny, everybody that ends up you know, in a profession, there's the group of people that, uh, like meticulously end up there. And there's the group of people that just kind of fall into it. Yeah. And I would say that I fall into that group of people that just kind of fall, fell into it. So I played professional sports. Um, I went to Stanford, did a civil engineering degree, played professional water polo, played for the national team. Um, and then I started working in 2011 and I spent the next four years basically like in sales, sales and marketing, product management, um, biz dev. And like, I basically was like searching for what, like, wait, light, this is work. This is what life is like. Like pro professional water polo was amazing. I lived in Hungary, got to travel the world with the national team. I didn't make any money, but man, it was fun. Mm -hmm. And here I am at 24, 20 or 27 now looking for like something I'm going to love. And I just, each year I was like, no, that's not it. No, that's not it. No, that's not it. And, um, 
I was in San Francisco one day uh, and I was staring at a parking ticket and I was like, you got to be kidding me. And um, I was an entrepreneur as well in there. So I was selling actual poop bags. <laughs> I started a dog poop. I started a dog poop bag business um, where I bought like an entire container full of poop bags and I was wow. uh, distributing them to different stores. We were in 30 different stores and wow. I basically, uh, we were giving 20% of uh, proceeds to local shelters. And what I, um, you know, direct to consumer as well, as well as through stores and, when I realized uh, I was like sitting there looking at a parking ticket, I was like, you gotta be kidding me. Like, this is ridiculous. Like I can't, I, I can't afford this from San Francisco, $90 ticket. And my, uh, my buddy gives me a call at that point. One of my, one of my friends from freshman year, Stanford gave me a call. And he's like, Hey, what are you up to? I was like, I'm looking at a parking ticket. And he's like, what are you doing? I was like selling poop bags. <laughs> he's, like, <laughs> he's like, what the hell dude? Like we were junior class presidents together. You were like, you know, one of the people that I really looked up to in school, like, what the hell's going on with you, man? I was like, I don't know, man. I just can't find what I love doing. Like, I just, I'm just lost right now. And so he's like, come, come over here. We, I, I work at a gaming studio called Rock You. We need, we're growing quickly. We need help. You're a smart guy. Like, I'm sure you can, you can do well. It's like, okay. So I went over there, interviewed there, and I took a job as a product manager. And within a month, they had me start to do marketing because I was doing it for my poop bag brand. And now they're like, you understand marketing? I was like, sure, I'll, I'll you know, I'm self-taught, but sure, I'll give it a try. And so this is 2014. Um, and so I start doing, you know, marketing for them for a poker product. And it was like, it was doing well. They're like, hey, cool, this is doing well. And then we acquired a company called that, a bunch of games from Kiwi. So we had Facebook games, casual games um core games mid core games um that we bought from a company called uh like kaiju was the studio name and a bunch of different types of games from casino to casual to mid core and basically i got into it from the product management perspective and then i you know went into doing marketing and then marketing was doing well so like hey can you do it all for us um that coupled with the fact that one person that was doing marketing for them left and they're like okay well you're the only <laughs> other person here that knows anything about marketing so yeah. you're gonna head this up and i was like okay so uh within a year of doing marketing or you know um i was already managing like a, a million to two million dollar budget per month um for all of our all of our titles and our biggest one was kitchen scramble and second biggest one was uh kingdoms of camelot and so Facebook games, mobile games, and I, it was about, about three months in where I realized like, oh, damn, like, this is something I actually want to do. This is something I'm passionate about, something yeah. I like. And it had kind of the perfect mix of, um, it had the perfect mix of uh, art and science mm -hmm. where I got to use my creativity, but I also got to use my math brain. And I was like, this is fun. And I also started to realize like, holy crap, this place is so new that like nobody knows what they're doing. Mm. Um, and so I started creating like LTV models for our game. And I started creating like, you know, trying to really, I, I had interviews with like every single ad network. And I really was like, wow, every single six months I'm doing this, I realized, wow, I thought I knew what I was doing six months ago. And I was just kept hitting this new plateau. I was like, wow, I can't believe I was like managing a $2 million budget. And I didn't know what I do know now. And so from there, I went to another gaming studio because they had way higher LTVs and I could spend a lot more so I could learn more. The more you spend, the more you learn. Um, that was a gaming studio that was focused on social casino. We got acquired um, and then it, we got acquired by a gambling company. Mm -hmm. And within about a year of being the director of marketing for Penn National um, Interactive, which is Penn National Gaming, uh, the biggest publicly traded um, casino company, they, uh, I, I started creating ads that were kind of user-generated user content. This was back in 2016, 17. Mm -hmm. And it was actually me in a Hawaiian shirt talking about how my casino host told me that I should play this game because it gets me ready for when I go to Vegas. And I saw how well it did. And we were just crushing it on like the 15th and the 30th of the month. Uh, and I was I like, it, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, this doesn't feel good. So yeah. um, I realized I wanted to do more like with my abilities. And I was like, mm -hmm. I think I'm good at this. I want to see how good I am at this. Mm -hmm. So I took a role at, at Lyft heading up their passenger acquisition. And then my budgets went up to like, you know, um, went up to 5 million a week. And then wow. we basically pulled back. Uh, my entire job there was actually pulling us back to 1 million a week. And all I did was basically just stop spending on a lot of channels and we kept growing at the same pace. So wow. a lot of, that was where I really learned about, you know, 
uh, incrementality and understanding measurement. And it was great being at Lyft because there was a whole data science team and engineering team. And just like, they were very math focused and, and, you know, so that was really, that was a great experience. And, um, while at Lyft, I ended up doing a little bit of consulting on the side, um, because I wanted to see, you know, one of the ways to get better at something is just to do as many, take as many swings as possible. Like working yeah. with an agency is one of the best ways to do that. And so I started doing my own agency work. I started creating, doing, um, consulting on the side and within six months, I already had like 10 clients and I was had two people working for me and, um, and I was just basically helping people scale their marketing mm -hmm. across apps, direct consumer products, subscription products. Um, and Masterclass was one of my clients. And at Lyft, I was like, we went from 2000 to 6,000 people and we went public. And I was like, this place is crazy. Like I can't, <laughs> I'm not, I'm not cut out for this. I need yeah. to learn. I need to learn what leadership's like. I'm good at marketing, but I need to learn what it means to like, you know, be able to run a marketing org that's big and like be able to handle that and not, you know, kill myself. So I left to go work for Masterclass and um, it was a great move. I went back to a hundred person company and nice. helped them go from like 40 million to 160 million in revenue. Wow. Um, large part due to just great content, but then mm -hmm. um, an even bigger part to do with just like, you know, fixing our performance marketing or making our performance marketing system just better to scale. Um, the person that was there before me had done a good job, but this was, you know, I just came in to, you know, put a lot more dollars in. And in the last year I was there um, and then I did that for like three years and then or two and a half years. And then I uh, have since left and basically am, did a little bit of consulting for a while and my own kind of, you know, thing. And then now I'm, uh, now I'm the CEO of a, a gaming studio. So I'm back in gaming, which got me started in, in marketing. So here I am. Circle of life. Circle. Yep. <laughs> yep. I would start out in water polo and professional sports and we've got kids now. I know they're going to be in gaming. So I'm like, yeah. you know what? Yeah. Let's, let's make this gaming space better. So I'm back in, I'm back into gaming. That's so funny. So um, that's crazy. So professional water polo, first of all, that's awesome. That is, yeah. uh, that's, that's funny. I, I, I saw this article somewhere. Someone was talking about, so um, do you, do you, do you surf as well? Yep. Yeah. Yep. Okay. So yeah, I, I, I love to surf also. And so someone was saying like, Hey, what's the best um, martial art for protecting yourself against like harsh localism in, in the water? And someone responded, water polo <laughs> <laughs> that's funny but i yeah. mean that's a, like a, that's a that's a brutal that's a brutal sport um that's that's amazing man playing at stanford and then going and traveling and then hungary that's that's super interesting too so i, yeah. I have heard that hungary is really good at water polo as well like it's a big a big deal there yeah they're the number one team for three olympics in a row and then recently they've been in top three but they haven't won in the last four like three olympics that's that, that's super cool though that's um yeah so, I mean, so going from selling the, the poop bags, right. To <laughs> <laughs> you're like dropped in the, dropped in the middle of that first company where you're managing, you're managing a million a month. Like, yep. what were you, like, how, how, how does that happen? Like, how is, what, what was your mindset just getting completely out of your element really? Like and taking the yeah. skills you learned, how did that go? So whenever I'm, you know, you have a new problem and you're trying to solve it, right. You got to quickly do a couple things. One is talk to all the experts you possibly can tell them this problem and say like, Hey, I need some help. Mm -hmm. Um, what would you do? And number two is like, read everything you possibly can on the subject. Um, at the time, the best source of information for like, what is marketing was actually Facebook. Mm -hmm. Um, it's like library. Mm -hmm. They had a lot of information on Facebook library and um, and then, uh, I met with like every ad network, um, and then our Facebook rep, our Google reps. And I basically just like set up multiple calls with them and just like dug in on like really understanding the infrastructure. The thing that I had a benefit of was that rock U was also an ad network. Um, so because of that, I got to see both sides of the, you know, the, the coin. Mm -hmm. So I got to see that we were selling ad space. So we mm -hmm. were the supplier and yeah. I got to, you know, we were buying ads as well. So I got to see like, what does that actually look like and really understand the infrastructure behind it mm -hmm. and look at it from like a product lens as well. What's actually happening with the waterfall. And so, um, you ask most marketers like today, like most of them just get into like, okay, this is how you buy on Facebook this is how you buy on Google. Um, Whereas what I, where I started was like from a product, product management perspective and really understanding like 
what are the like what's the underlying systems of happening that are happening here what are actually like the engineering calls that are happening to you know fill an ad what does it look like when the ad doesn't get filled and i got to see all of that from the like rock you side because we had access to all that because we were managing like all of the ads for facebook ads within games mm-hmm. so all the zynga games we had the contract with zynga wow see i got to see what happens when an ad doesn't fill and then you have like the the filler ad and like what, how to actually set up a waterfall and how to alter your waterfall. So I got to understand both sides of it so that when I went and talked to like ad networks and went and talked to like, look at Google and Facebook, I was looking at it as what, how do these guys fill their ads? What is the underlying tech? And then therefore, what does that mean we need to do to win auctions for the people we want to win auctions for? Because marketing is not just about, you know, targeting the right people. It's also winning that auction when you're actually available to show that person an ad. So I would say, um, it was, you know, just like water polo, just threw me in the pool and just had to figure it out. And that was the approach that I took was just saying, let me really understand what's happening here. And then actually uh, at the same time, like um, then, you know, run that the media spend. So there was a good month and a half there where like, I probably wasn't doing anything right. Um, just wasting money or doing what, doing what the ad networks were telling me to do, but then mm-hmm. you know, very quickly started to kind of learn it. So it was a, it was a, like I said, I look back on it. I'm like, damn, like, you know, there's a lot of people that probably could have done a better job. If I, you know, maybe rock use titles would have done really well. Had I been like a seasoned marketer instead of a June, you know, just starting, you know? Yeah. Makes sense. I mean, to be fair, the other person left. So. <laughs> yeah, I know the other person <laughs> left. So it was like, Hey, I got to, somebody has got to do it. And I was like, yeah. sure, I'll do it. step up to the plate. That's amazing. Yep. So, so where does that fit in with, you remember machine zone? Um, yep. Machine zone. Yeah. I actually interviewed with them. They had, they had a job offer to me and um, back then, and I chose to go to rock you or uh, rocket games um, instead of machine zone. So at the time, the two different types of companies out there that were had high LTVs in the mobile space were social casino mm-hmm. and mid core games. And so I, I chose to go to, you know, a social casino company um, mostly because I love the team. Mm -hmm. Um, It's actually the founder of that company is the company I'm working for now. Um, And so whereas Machine Zone, um, they were extremely knowledgeable. They knew what they were doing from a media buying perspective on how to like blanket the market and win. Um, But what I saw was that when I played the game, I just, I didn't think it was that good. So yeah, Yeah. um, I chose to, I chose to go to, go to uh, Rocket Games instead. What were the, so when you say high LTVs, like what were the, what are, what was a high LTV at that point? So 2014. Yeah. 20, it was 2015. Now the high LTVs were basically, um, if you're talking about iOS game, um, in the U S it was looking at anywhere between like, um, eight to $18, Mm -hmm. um, was kind of what you were looking at. And when I say LTV, I'm talking about a two year LTV. Okay. Yeah. So not a four year or five years in within two years, your average customer will end up making, let's call it 10 bucks. So then, so what kind of KPIs were you orienting around for, for that? Yeah. So back then, um, the main thing that I was looking at was actually, and this is what I said, if I knew more, what I know today, I would have done it differently. But like back then, the way we were optimizing everything was on a, um, cost per install, um, basis. And then it turned into cost per like payer basis, Mm -hmm. but the cost per install by channel. And so it wasn't like an overall, Hey, I put in a million dollars this month. How much money did I come came back? It was more like I put in 10 grand on this channel this week. What, like, what did it say? What did our attribution partner say we made from that channel this week? And, or what it, how many installs did it say we got? And then we would just look at the install the not, like the revenue that came from those installs and mm-hmm. then project those out for a two year period. And then we constantly be monitoring it every two weeks. We'd add in more data to then be able to see where is that LTV going? And then we'd make a projection based on that. And we would just make sure that the LTVs were still following a similar curve as past ones to know that like, Hey, we have, we have, you know, like 70% confidence. This is going to be like a $6 cohort or a $10 cohort. And then we knew that we paid $5 for them. So it's like, cool. We, you know, that was a profitable purchase. Got it. So, so they were comfortable with that kind of time frame for seeing the return on investment. Yeah. So I'd say at rock U, we were more, it was, it was quicker, but then at rocket games, it was longer because social casino, like 
buyers are a lot more sticky. Mm. Whereas um, like the casual titles or the, uh, you know, um, time management games like kitchen scramble or like cooking games, Mm -hmm. they're not as strong in terms of retention. And, and so your LTVs, you're going to want to try and get payback a lot sooner. Um, As you can imagine, like a, a two dots style of game, like people play for a week. So you better get payback in a week. Otherwise you're, you're gone. You're mm-hmm. going to lose money. So uh, for some of the titles at rock, you, we are at three months um, payback. Other titles were, you know, um, a maximum of six months. Um, whereas when I got, when I went to rock games, it was like, yeah, we were okay with two years. Um, and then when I went to Penn, which was a gambling company, like it was like, yeah, we're okay with like four years, mm-hmm. um, which started to feel really weird. It's like in the first month you make 20% back. I was like, that doesn't feel right. Like, yeah. you know, with the, with the way, at, you know, the way um, your ARP DAO curves look like for individual new users, average revenue per daily active user. Okay. Like usually they spend more in the beginning and then you have less and less people that spend. So then it, it drops off and it becomes like that, you know, um, that curve. It's not linear. It's not exponential. It's logarithmic. Got it. So so we're going through some of the some of the metrics and talking about some of the more science, I guess, side of things. And then so on the sort of art or the right brain side of what you're doing at that point, how are you thinking about attracting the right kind of attention for people and, and getting them to click and install and, and yeah. buy? This is uh it's actually the there's a couple of methods. I mean, if you're talking about app installs, there's a couple of methods. If you're talking about you know direct to consumer products, there's other methods, but like I would, if I talk about um, app install as an example, like the first thing everyone should do, which they don't do is go and play competitor products, mm-hmm. go and open those apps, play them. And you're going to see ads. When you see those ads, um, look at what those ads are, see how they are. Like just start looking at all these different ads and you're going to start to notice like a theme or you're going to start to notice like a certain app that's like good. Um the uh, or sort of ads that are good. And then you're like, wow, that's, that gives me an idea for something we could do with our ad. Um, the other thing that you should do is take a note of like who the network is, you know, the ad networks um, that are like, you know, placing those ads. Cause that'll give you an idea of where you should also, you should also, probably also be looking at which ad network you should be using. So you could, sh- your ads can show up in that app as well. Um, in terms of direct consumer, the, the best thing you can do is actually just look at the channel you're in and look at the content that's the most engaging, mm. not even look at ads. The organic so content. just like one of the things that I did very early on, um, on Facebook was I just started filming myself and filming people that I knew talking about a product. And it, what happens is that's the type of content you see on your Facebook feed, um, before everyone switched to Instagram. So like you, that's the type of content that's going to be seen as an ad. And so the more native you could make your ads, the better they're going to perform. And Mm -hmm. so from an artistic perspective, it's just coming up with like what just noticing, like what's Nate, what's the most native feeling and then brainstorming with your team on like, what's an ad that we could create, you know, cost effectively Mm -hmm. that'll basically feel really good in this platform. And people Mm -hmm. are going to be likely to engage with. And the reason engagement becomes really important uh, engagement with the ad becomes really important is because you get all the free benefit of when people like it, share it, comment on it. Mm -hmm. Um, whereas, you know, when you just have things that are built specifically around an install, there's none of that benefit. And when I say the benefit, like literally all the impressions that happen from somebody sharing an ad, those are free to you. You're not paying for those. Um, all the impressions that happen when somebody comments on an ad, like then it shows up in the next person that they're friends with feed. You're not paying for that. So that's something that like, isn't accounted for, but it is something that does make a big difference in the performance because then, if that gets shared and somebody clicks on it, um, that one of their friends, then you, you, it, it does attribute back to you that ad, even though you didn't actually have to pay for that impression. Got it. Got it. That's, that's interesting. And then, I mean, bringing it back to attribution at that stage. So you mentioned attribution partners. So what, what was your approach to actually evaluating these different channels at that point? Yeah. At that point, it was basically using one of four attribution partners. Um, back then, there was Tune, Adjust, Apps Flyer, um, were like the three main ones. And then the fourth one was Kachava. And basically, those are um, MMPs, Mobile Measurement Partners. And all they were doing is basically using IDFA and GAIDs, your mobile 
um, identifiers, ad identifiers to basically say, where was the last click from? from? So therefore this is who should get credit. Um, and then on, you know, the web-based products, we were using Tune because Tune was basically just like using a, you know, cookie-based attribution. Um, so you stick a cookie on your browser or on your game, and then they, you put their, you put the advertiser's cookie on your game and basically they're able to then tell, okay, this person clicked from our ad, they landed on your site. These are, these are, this was one of my, you know, purchases. So, um, that was basically what we were using and, you know, I look back on it now and I'm just like, it's not a clear picture because it's just one, it's just one data point. It's just one attribution partner. And that attribution partner is flawed for a lot of reasons. Like, you know, it's the same old, like, Hey, last click. Well, last click, are you going to get everything? Are you going to give all value to Google search? No, like people didn't come and only buy because of Google search. They came because of the advertising you're doing elsewhere. Right. Gotcha. Gotcha. And then, and then so taking that initial experience with, you know, you just went at, at Penn Interactive, at um, at Rock U, and and you said Rockstar as well, right? Yeah, Rock U, Rocket Games. Rock, sorry, Rocket and, Games. And, yeah. Yeah, 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 Rocket so, Games. Yep. Yep. And then so and then you made that shift to Lyft, where you're actually going after it was you're going after was it riders or drivers at that point? Uh, so I was heading up passenger acquisition. Passenger so it was all riders. Yep. yep. But we had, yeah. So making that switch, like one of the big things that changed is in any brand, there's the stage at which you can start and you can, when you start a new brand or a new product, you're always going to pick up the low hanging fruit, the people that mm -hmm. the direct people that want that product. Um, when you get to be the size, like an awareness level of like lift, you start to be like, how much value is there to be doing, you know, direct to consumer performance style of marketing? Mm -hmm. um, when you're a brand new company, it's like, you should only do performance marketing because that's going to be the biggest value, right? You're not a brand new company. I'm like, Hey, I'm going to pay for like a blimp commercial. It's like, wh wh why would you, why would you do that? You're not yeah. going to, it's not going to pay off. You'd right. rather just show the exact person that's looking for that exact product. Right. And now like when you start to get bigger, like Lyft, it's like, okay, well, how many millions of dollars have you spent every single day or every single week to the point where like, Hey, you've exhausted that audience. Mm. Um, so what are you to start doing to actually like reach brand new audiences on these channels like Facebook and Google or YouTube or any new channels. And mm. so the game starts to become, when you look at your awareness level and you're like, dude, our awareness level is 50% and that's nationwide. Well, what does that mean? Your awareness level is in San Francisco or like New York where like, it's a, you know, where, Rideshare companies are really, really like that's where most of the business is coming from, cities or urban areas. I would argue those awareness levels are more like 70 or 80%. And so it's like when your awareness levels are that high, what like what value is there in doing like a, a performance marketing like media purchase when you've been doing it for the past three years and hitting that same audience? Mm -hmm. Um, and so you have to start to look at different things in order to really understand what is the value and you have to start to do things like incrementality testing and you have to start creating new views in your data to really understand, you know, correlation between growth and the things that you're actually doing on the, on the like media buying side or the, you know, growth funnel side. So how are you, how are you, that's the biggest question is for, for me at least is how are you assessing this sort of 50% what do you call it? Um, brand awareness, aware, level. awareness yeah. level versus say 50% nationwide versus 75% in these specific cities. How are you, yeah. how, are, how are you getting a, a glimpse at that and quantifying that? Yeah. So um, if any, like if you're a brand and you start to see like your performance marketing starting to slow down, one of the things you really have to start to question is like, have we hit our total addressable market in the style of media buying we've been doing recently? Mm. Um, or the, over the past two years. And I would argue that the, that the answer is likely yes. And I say in the style. Um, and the way to find out if you've first hit that is you do have to pay for like a brand um, awareness tracker. Mm -hmm. um, they can cost anywhere between like, like 2K to 15K um, a quarter. Mm -hmm. um, and all it is is like it sends out a, a quarterly you know, survey for uh that it either shows up in apps or it shows up on like paid surveys and or incentivized surveys like if you're in a game like hey get this many free tokens or this ticket if you like yeah. take the survey 
And the survey has something along the lines of, hey, uh, click on one of the, you know, rideshare companies you're aware of or you've heard of. And mm-hmm. they like click on Lyft and Uber, but they don't click on, you know, some uh, ways or some mm-hmm. some third one. Um, and then like, um, and then like they have another question. It's like, hey, uh, list a rideshare company. Mm. And that's, and then when you say list the rideshare company and they, they, or list all the rideshare companies, you know, um, if they don't lift, they, if that's called, uh, unaided awareness. Mm-hmm. And then there's aided awareness where you actually show them the brand and they click on it. Got so it. you're, you're capturing that. And I, it's really important to actually start to have that as a metric because the higher your awareness gets the less and less valuable, um, direct to consumer performance marketing is. Um, and the more it starts to make sense to be creating, uh, a layer of brand marketing, um, that is moving up funnel a little bit in the messaging, as well as in like the targeting style and the different places that you're placing the ads. And yeah, so that's, that's basically what I ran into at Lyft. I was like, wow, we're spending all this money on Facebook, but we've been spending all this money on Facebook for four years Mm -hmm. uh, or five years. And I'm like, Every time we did anything big, I was like, I'm not seeing any change. Mm-hmm. So one of the things I was looking at is like most people get stuck into looking at like, what is the Facebook portal platform telling you I'm making? What is my MMP saying I'm making? And, or that's, you know, what's my cost per install or what's my cost per acquisition for these? And what I basically started to notice just by looking at the overall business is it doesn't seem like what is saying on what Facebook's reporting or what the MMP is reporting is actually aligning with what our actual business is doing in terms of total, you know, when I say our actual business, like the actual Apple reported installs and the Google reported installs and adding those two together. I was like, either these are like reinstalls or Mm -hmm. they're, uh, or they're just like taking organic installs. I, I need to see what's going on here. So I started to actually design incrementality tests where I literally just said, I'm just gonna, you know, turn off this channel in this region for this long and see what happens. Mm. Um, and basically we started to do that for different channels and that's like the easiest way to do it. The, mm. it's not the most accurate, you know, um, you want to have two regions that you feel like are act similarly and you want to make sure you do, you hold other things constant when you do it and you turn off, you turn one off and you leave the other one going and you see what happens. Mm. But basically what we saw was that some of the channels we were spending on or most of them actually weren't doing anything. Mm. Um, so we, we turned it off. And at that point in our business, one of the biggest things that was do, driving growth was actually um, B2B uh, enterprise uh, partnerships. Oh. So hotels, you know, hotels that need a pickup instead of ordering a taxi, they order a lift. Hmm. Um, and then the other big one was just uh, was around uh, targeting, uh, targeting Uber. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Google search for Uber term. So Huh. That was, uh, that's what basically we figured out. And I was like, okay, let's pull back spend on all these other channels. And we did that. And lo and behold, uh, performance, like growth continued at the same rate. Got it. That's wild. So like, how do you, how do you structure those incrementality tests? Do you do it? Like how long do you run that for before you say, Hey, look, this, this channel wasn't working. Let's pull the plug. Let's pull back. Yeah. So I, what I recommend is that like, so I did, I, I did that at Lyft. And then I, when I got to masterclass, I was like, I really want to refine this more. And when I got to masterclass, we were in that like 10% awareness. So um, at that point, when I joined, I was like, okay, cool. 10% awareness in the U S much lower, you know, a third of that abroad. And basically what I, what I, uh, so we could just lean super hard into performance marketing. We leaned so hard into performance marketing because every time we did that sales went up. Mm-hmm. And so what I basically, it, it sounds really old school, but like, um, as an example, let's say you're a product that makes 10 sales a week and you don't do any advertising mm-hmm. and now you turn on Facebook ads and you spend a hundred dollars or let's say you spend a thousand dollars in a month. Um, and your 10 sales a day becomes 20 sales, 10 sales a week becomes 20 sales a week. You're like, mm-hmm. okay, like what changed? Well, I added Facebook. Mm-hmm. Um, the next month you go, okay, cool. Now we're going to add YouTube mm-hmm. and we spent a thousand dollars on YouTube and you're now 20 sales a week becomes 40 sales a week. And you're like, holy crap. Like, well, guess what? You're able to see that because you're a brand new brand and you're not, you don't have like hundreds of things going on at once. And there's right. so many variables. 
So by spending $20 or 10, you know, a thousand dollars on YouTube, you actually say, oh shit, like YouTube's actually way more uh, beneficial here than, than Facebook was interesting. Um, and so the hard part here is that most brands aren't just starting out. Most brands aren't just like sitting they're not spending any money. So what I recommend is, you know, what I did at masterclass is like, um, is actually looking at everything holistically. Um, and, and then before you start changing anything, so to look at everything holistically, you have to create a view for yourself to really monitor, you know, closely monitor what's happening. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is, you know, that, um, your sales is associated with things that you're doing with the product or things you're doing with, you know, specific, specifically new sales actually is mostly to do with what you're doing with, um, you know, with your acquisition or your media buying. And so what you have to do is you got to monitor those, those new sales very closely. And what I, what I do is like every single day, I just look at what that number is and I chart it. And I also then chart all the things that we're doing and on the media side and what's changed. So What's the media mix between Facebook, Google, um, you know, any Apple spend, if you're doing app installs, um, any uh, like YouTube, uh, ad networks, uh, TV, podcast, radio display, and you see, okay, what, what's happening. Okay, cool. When I add more Facebook, it looks like it does bump sales. When I add more YouTube, it looks like it does bump sales. When I add some of this network, it doesn't look like it did much. Um, and so you just, I want, I recommend starting with that. And then um, with that, then you can add, you can also, um, you know, what, that's what I did at, at Masterclass. And I said, okay, we need to actually get more visibility here into all the different data points. And so I ended up creating like a dashboard um, where I looked at every single like attribution method that's out there. Um, and what we looked at was uh, we created an MMM model, media mix model, which basically said, here's the revenue we made this day. Here's the money we spent on the different channels. So all the X variables were all the different spends and the Y variables revenue, new revenue that day. Um, and it was easy for us because the new revenue is a one-year subscription, which, you know, made it easier. What if you're doing LTV model, if you had a product that you're not just talking about new sales, but you're actually, you want to put in that like value of that customer at that point, um, rather than just like the revenue on for day one. Uh, but so then the next step, we had the MMM model, um, and then we had the, uh, we had like the last click model. Um, then we had the platform reported model. And with those three, I was like, yeah, this is good, but I, I want something that's a little bit like also like old school. So then we added the, how did you hear about us survey? Mm -hmm. Um, so that people can just tell us how they heard about us. And so with those, those four were like the main ones that we use to really gauge, okay, what's happening here. Um, and as an example, you might see, I spend more money on Facebook and the Facebook says, hey, you're doing really good. Like mm -hmm. your, your CPAs are staying constant, keep spending here. But then, you know, and your MMM model might say like, hey, Facebook's your, your best channel. It's, you know, it has the biggest impact when you spend a dollar, it looks like you make $2 there. Mm -hmm. So spend more there. Um, but then you look at the, how did you hear about us? And how did you hear about us says that like you're breaking even. And when I say, how did you hear about us? It's like, what you do is you take, all the people that say they came in from Facebook and you take that being like the total number of people. And then you, um, you report, you look at what is your um, return on ad spend based on that. Mm -hmm. So you can say like, Hey, we spent this amount. Um, or you look at your CPA based on that. You say, we spent a thousand dollars and we got based on how did you hear about us? We got 10. So that means that our CPA was, you know, hundred bucks. Mm -hmm. You can also do it by, um, ROAS. So you can just say like, we had a hundred people, um, and those people are worth this. And then you can divide that by the cost. And then you could use ROAS to say like, oh, we always want to be at like 120% ROAS based on how did you hear about us? Mm -hmm. So you have all your channels. How did you hear about us based ROAS? You have all of your channels ROAS based on um, Facebook reported, Google reported, platform reported. And then you have your last click and then you have your um, MMM model. And by looking at all those, you can actually start to point out like, hey, all of these agree that we should spend more on Facebook and all of these, but Hey, this one right here, this data point's interesting. It's like YouTube looks like it's actually way better than what YouTube's actually reporting to us. Mm -hmm. Our MMM model showing it's much, much more valuable. Our, how did you hear about us model showing it's much more valuable. And our last click actually says that it's worse. And our Facebook um, and our, and our YouTube report, it says that it's worse. And I'm like, huh, there's something there that like mm -hmm. you should look into 
And so that's what would, that's the, where you're looking for is like some anomalies there we can actually test further into. And when you say, talk about doing like incrementality, this is the thing that I warn people on is that the way people do incrementality tests is they usually say like, okay, in that scenario where YouTube looks like maybe we should spend more there, they either don't spend enough or they actually uh, don't change thing. Like they, they change something else in the system at the same time. Mm -hmm. And so what I recommend is like, you have to make something like a 50% difference on that channel to actually okay. see a jump. And so if you're spending a thousand dollars a day on YouTube, you got to jump to at least $2,000 a day to see anything. And you got to hold for at least like two weeks, like minimum. Wow. And you just have to let it happen and just see, okay, how does this change things? Mm -hmm. um, and you, you want to be monitoring total sales. You want to be monitoring your, how did you hear about us? You want to be monitoring all the different metrics or all the different dashboards that you have, or, um, attribution models that you have to see, like, did this change? Are we seeing a, are we seeing a change here? Got it. That's super interesting. So, you know, hypothetically taking it one step back. So I'm mm -hmm. with the, um, with the, uh, the sort of brand tracker that you mentioned earlier on where you, like that, that point at which you decide, Hey, look, we got to go more top of funnel, build that awareness. I mean, what, what do you, is there any kind of milestone that you look for where that starts to be more relevant or thinking in those terms starts to be more relevant? Like in terms yeah, of ads? Definitely. Like, okay. Yeah, definitely. So, um, you know, everyone talks about ad fatigue. What's really happening with ad fatigue and when I, what ad fatigue, when you see ad fatigue, it's when click through rates start going down, which then causes your CPMs to go up. So the platform's charging more to show the same, to show that audience ads. Um, and then the other thing is when your frequencies start going up too. That's also an indicator um, at that, like, hey, you, you've exhausted this audience, at least for the people that that network wants to show that ad to. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that you should be looking at is, is ad fatigue as the first step. But what does ad fatigue mean? Ad fatigue actually means like the, the look and feel of that ad. Mm -hmm. So um, what most companies like don't understand is that when they're doing creative iteration, um, so let me take a quick step back until you hit like 40% or 30%, like 30, 40% unaided awareness or aided awareness, like aided awareness, actually, you don't need to worry about like, you don't need to worry about, um, like doing top of funnel, mm -hmm. but you should make sure that your bottom of funnel or performance marketing related, like conversion focused ads are like, do have a brand feeling. Mm, right? okay. You don't want to have something that's like super off brand because mm -hmm. you're building an awareness through your performance marketing ads. And eventually those people will buy is usually mm -hmm. what happens. And so until you hit to that point, you can still just keep hammering on performance marketing. What I mean by that is optimized towards a purchase mm -hmm. is like what the only thing you actually need to be doing. You shouldn't be doing like optimized towards a click, optimizing towards an email capture, optimizing towards, you know, a, um, awareness, like none of that, you don't need to touch any of that stuff, um, until you get to that awareness level. And so, uh, but when you're in that earlier stage, like if you feel like, oh, this isn't working anymore, but your awareness is still really low. That just means you haven't actually reached everybody yet hmm. in the audience of people. And the reason you haven't reached anybody yet, everybody yet is because of the fact that your creative isn't diverse enough. Hmm. So this is like, this is the key point here that most people miss. Um, your creative for programmatic networks is what determines who your ad is shown to. So if I'm on Facebook or YouTube, guess what? Facebook and YouTube know me and they know what I interact with. Mm -hmm. So if an ad gets thrown into the waterfall and it's like for a competition in the auction and that ad is for, it's why on Facebook, like I don't get women's lingerie or like women's clothing ads or swimsuit ads, because like, I don't interact with, you know, media in my Facebook account that, that shows up like that. Um, whereas like, and I also don't get baby ads mm -hmm. Well, you know, for, for my, my kids stuff, but my wife, my wife does get it. And it's not just because she's a woman. It's because she interacts with that ad. She stays mm -hmm. on something like that for longer. If I ever mm -hmm. get one, I scroll through it so fast that Facebook's like, okay, Thomas never wants to see this. So yeah. 
the reason I say that is because what does that mean? Well, let's unpack it a little bit. Let's say you're selling, you know, um, men's laundry detergent. Well, guess like if your buyer, if you believe your buyer is always men, then you might actually be putting all of your creative with men's laundry detergent with women in that creative. Okay. Well, men are going to see, men are going to be more likely to see that ad. Um, but then you go and say, Hey, well, wait a second. Maybe women are the ones where maybe we have this massive opportunity to like sell to women. Well, guess what? In order to reach those women, you better put like the right woman in that ad or the mm. right, or a man in that ad, because that's going to be what like that woman's likely going to interact with. Mm. And so therefore that's, what's going to allow that creative to actually even be of eligible to be shown as an ad mm. um, to that person. Because if your ad in your video or your static ad isn't the content that that person wants to see, you won't even be available to actually be in the auction for that person. Got so it. you start seeing creative fatigue when you actually are not diversifying your creative enough. And mm -hmm. you see this so many times with brands you have like, well, our look and feel is like this whimsical, like, you know, um, content that's like, uh, you, you know, um, all computer animated, you know, ads I'm like, well, cool. Guess what? Like 50% of the people don't want to see computer animated ads. So Facebook and Google are never going to show the like that people. So like, yeah, you're going to get, you're going to create a fatigue really fast. So you better diversify and start to have people in your ads or start to have different styles of content that people are going to interact with. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it definitely makes a lot of sense. I mean, so, I think, yeah. yeah. Do you think, so how, how was it, what's been your experience in terms of thinking of on the, time time sequencing on the like on a video for instance in terms of like early signals that are fed back to the ad network based on kind of what you're saying there yeah so in terms of uh video content i mean youtube is probably the best platform to be able to see this because you know youtube you have um you got the five seconds that people are like you know can't change mm -hmm. but they give a view that allows you to actually see like the, the drop off, um, mm -hmm. what percentage of people are still watching after X number of seconds. And it's a really good correlation to like how, in, how well the videos is going to do is actually how long people are watching that video. Um, and so what we uh, ended up using is uh, somebody at, at masterclass on my team actually came up with what he was calling thumb stopping rate. Um, which was basically the amount of people that watch like 50% um, of the video or 15 seconds of the video, sorry, over the amount of people that started watching the video. So like the number that, you know, watched one second. So 15 seconds over one second. Mm -hmm. And that was a really good indicator for how likely they are then going to be to click, how likely they are even then to, to purchase. So the tough part is that ever since iOS 14.5, things have kind of broken in terms of like understanding if somebody's going to actually end up purchasing. So we're at a place now where we have to optimize towards, you know, the event we want, but we still have to use upper funnel metrics to then determine if something's doing well. Whereas before upper funnel metrics could look bad and you could just keep running that ad. And if you spend enough, it would find the right audience that would sell. And so today we have to like cut our losses quicker because we can't just let you know, Facebook, Google, all these ad networks just like spend money until we, until it finds the group, because instead of finding the right group in, you know, 5k in spend, it's taking now 50k in spend to find that right group. Gotcha. Gotcha. I definitely want to, to revisit that, especially in context of what you're doing now. Um, mm -hmm. But um, I'm just really curious, you know, you're talking about digging into the the view, the deeper view metrics at masterclass. And, you know, I think in early, com earlier conversation, you were telling me how you're spending like, in some cases, a million dollars a day across how, how, like what, what platforms were you on? Um, yeah. And, and uh, yeah, I mean, what were some of the, the biggest takeaways you had in getting to play with that kind of offer and, you know, with all those amazing creatives, all those amazing celebrities, et cetera, I'm just curious what that was like going from, from Lyft and then being dropped into a completely different situation over at Masterclass. I would say um, Masterclass uh, was basically the most ideal content you can possibly have to market on social channels. Um, because who do, what do people interact with 
on social channels are people that they recognize and they know. Mm-hmm. So, um, and the fact that that is your product makes it even that much easier. So like I had the perfect and the other piece that happened is because of the fact that our, our instructor base was so diverse in age, gender, ethnicity, um, I got to market to everybody. Um, and so, and, and the type of comp, like type of, uh, content they were, you know, teaching. So, um, in a lot of ways, most people struggle with like content diversity. And I, the reason I knew this was going to be a huge opportunity is because I, one of the companies that I consulted for was a, was a friending, um, app. And what I saw, what I learned really quickly there was that the people that come into your app is based on who, like the type of person that you're advertising. So when I went to masterclass, I looked at what, how they, we had the account structure and I was like, Hmm, this actually, we should change the way that we're doing this. We should, we should make it be, um, in a way that, uh, focuses on the individual and let that individual be shown to the individual people that are interested in that individual and not be bucketing people based on categories. Hmm. And so, um, in a lot of ways we took like the style of like direct consumer, like, uh, products where it's, you know, send people to a category, let them find the product and then retarget them with the same product or that category. And we basically said, no, because we have products that can be so well defined on like knowing exactly who the customer is. Um, let's take our hundred products and actually just let Facebook and Google find the exact person that wants that product versus the the next product. And so our account structures were set up much differently. And what that allowed us to do um, is scale more than other companies are able to do um, to the point where, you know, SNL was making fun of us uh, because like we were able to, and the reason that we were able to do that uh, is we were winning everybody, everyone's auction. Hmm. You couldn't get away from masterclass because we were winning the auction. Well, guess what? It's because our ads were so much more targeted Mm -hmm. than everybody else's. So when you saw an ad, it was likely that you were into that topic or into that person. And so because of that, we had great, you know, positive sentiment Mm -hmm. and good click through rates, good viewership rates. So Facebook's algorithm says these are great ads for this, for this audience. So then we, we end up being at the top of the waterfall of everyone's, you know, everyone's feed. Got it. And then how are you, so talking through the, the attribution dashboard that you walked us through a little bit earlier. So how are you at, at masterclass? How are you looking at say like Steph Curry's versus um what's chris voss versus yeah yeah versus yeah yeah, everyone how are you how are you looking at are you like breaking it down by product or like i'm just curious how that all shakes out yeah um so (laughs) i would talk about pre ios 14.5 and post ios 14.5 sure sure. so before ios 14.5 i would not break it out at all i mean i would break them out completely they're completely different even at the ad layer um, mm-hmm. you know, uh, I wouldn't put the same ad or two different instructors in the same ad set because the ad set is the level that, or the ad group on Google is the level that determines the audience. And like, you don't want to have, uh, it have to be that a basketball audience is going to be the same as a negotiation audience. Mm-hmm. Um, so you want to make it so that they are in separate groups. And then even to the point where like, you know, you have Chris Voss, who's teaching negotiation. Well, we also have another instructor um, that's teaching negotiation uh, in a different, a different way. And it's a woman. Mm -hmm. Well, you don't necessarily want them in the same uh, ad group because they're different target audiences. So um, you have to be really conscious of like understanding who is my target audience and therefore keep them in, like make sure that the ads are set up in a way that are going to hit that target audience. And you're not going to actually confuse the algorithm. Right. So if, as an ex- we're, you know, the greatest example, like, let's say you have somebody like Ninja, who's mm-hmm. like teaching how to like stream on Twitch mm-hmm. versus Anna Wintour. Mm-hmm. Like those are going to be completely different audiences. You yep. never want them to be in the same ad group. You put them mm-hmm. in the same ad group. All you're going to do is make your performance worse mm-hmm. and you're going to make it so your ad, that ad set or ad group doesn't scale. Mm-hmm. And so you have to make sure those are in different ad groups and different ad sets mm-hmm. and let them scale in their own right. Because Anna Wintour is going to be, you know, women generally a little bit older, more affluent and people 
that are might be watching, you know, Twitch or wanting to learn how to stream gaming and make money that way are probably going to be younger male. So you never want to put those together. And so you got to be really thinking about who is this, who is this ad going to be shown to? And then you actually want to monitor it too. You want to monitor when you show that ad, who actually is that ad being shown to? And that's going to give you an idea of like, should this be in the same ad set as this other one? Mm -hmm. Um, And now post iOS 14.5, the hard part is you actually have this issue with like amount of signal coming in. Mm. And so because you have less signal per ad and because the data is being like aggregated and then like basically guessed by Facebook and Google, it's just like guessing. I think this is where we should attribute these sales um, or these subscriptions or um, these signups. You have to actually consolidate to less. And so it becomes more of a game of, taking your best five or your best three mm-hmm. and doing your absolute, you know, doing your best to figure out which those best ones are. And then mm-hmm. putting all of your kind of effort behind those, the, those ones so that they, all the data gets concentrated to those. Wow. So it's less, less niche focused, just more super broad. And, and what's happened is you're not going to, at least from what I've ta- been able to see, you're not going to get the same performance you used to be able to get at the same scale. Mm -hmm. Um, because you won't, you don't, and this is frustrating and nobody's talking about this, but like what Apple made that change, what Apple did was make it less likely for you as a consumer to see a product that you as a consumer would be interested in. Um, because a company like, as an example, a company like, um, masterclass as an example, like you, if you're have a specific like of a certain type of product, um, that product, like, let's say it's, you know, piano, mm-hmm. if that's not one of the major ones that's being like promoted right now, then you're not going to see that ad. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it makes it so you're less likely to know that like, Hey, there's a, there's a, somebody who has an amazing course on, on piano that like, I'm not, you're not going to know about. Um, so it, it makes it really, it's fresh. It's been frustrating for me to see that the rhetoric's been about, you know, creating privacy for people, but people don't realize that, um, that amount of privacy makes it so that you don't actually see ads. You're less likely to see ads for things that you actually want, mm-hmm. um, anymore. Mm-hmm. It's hard. It's harder. Got it. So, yeah, I mean, so do you, do you think I've heard a little bit of some rumblings about, for instance, that, um, instead of tracking users, we're going to be tracking creatives and like people will be on anonymously grouped into how they respond to a given creative. Like the, that's kind of the orienting point of the cohorts. I'm just, I'm just curious, you know, what sort of uh, conspiracy theories, hypotheses you've heard and are, are seeing. Yeah. I'm um, so what I believe is that, uh, the wall of gardens are coming down. Mm-hmm. I think that Google, Facebook, Apple, they're holding on to it as long as they can by creating these, these walls of gar- wall of gardens. I am of the belief that because of regulation and because of like blockchain technology mm-hmm. that we're actually going to see more and more people and consumers like great products like Fortnite being like, screw it. I'm not going to be in the app store. Yeah. You know, if you're not going to let me, if you're going to keep taking 30% of every purchase, I'm just not going to, we're not going to be on your platform. Yep. Um, and then if enough big players do that, then Apple, you know, Google, Facebook, they have to be like, all right, looks like we have to start accepting like PayPal purchases. looks like we have to not take the 30%, 20%. And you're starting to see that too. Like Apple has already announced that like there were a court case that like, Hey, you have to, um, you know, you have to actually allow other payment processors, but then they came back and like gave away that like only certain countries are doing it. So like there's a battle still, but I believe it's going to be opened up more, Mm -hmm. um, which means that we're going to open, there's, there's going to be more opportunity to go back to a place where you do have a little bit more visibility into like the user level. Yeah. The other thing that I think is going to happen, um, the other big trend that I think is going to happen is that I think that the big advertising platforms Mm -hmm. are going to actually uh, start to have all the transactions happen within their platform. Oh, wow. So, you know, like you have Instagram shops. Yeah. Like there's no reason why there shouldn't be Facebook shops. There was no reason why there shouldn't be YouTube shops. Mm -hmm. And so you purchase in the platform, you never have to leave Mm -hmm. and you don't have to go external to see the website. It's like websites are all Shopify websites and like 
not necessarily the best websites anyway. Yeah. So why not just take it and put it in platform? Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's been the reason why Facebook's earnings didn't go down as much as it should have, um, because they still had a lot of stores that, you know, were in uh, within Instagram. So they didn't, they didn't, they didn't get hurt as bad with iOS mm-hmm. 14.5 stuff. But um, I think that we're in this weird stage where I believe in about a year, we're going to be like, oh, cool. Like things aren't broken anymore. I can see data again. Um, that's what I think. I think Facebook, you know, I, I think Facebook's going to innovate their way out of this. And I think, um, I think we're going to end up in a place where it's like, oh, you remember that weird time in 2020 and 2021, 21 and 22, where like, we, we couldn't really like see as much data as we, you know, lets us make great decisions in marketing. Um, and it felt more like we're brand marketing. Um, I think that's going to be like a weird, just like bump in the road on performance marketing. So, so, and I, I always, I can get these terms mixed up. So is that basically, we're talking about taking something that right now is third party data and then making it first party. Yep. Taking okay. what, yeah, taking the, and the way, the reason that's important is that the, this, this is something people aren't talking about, but the reason why this was so important, I was 14.5 isn't that, uh, it, the biggest reason is that Facebook, what was happening is we, every advertiser was benefiting from every other advertiser. So if you notice when you set up your API or you set up your, your, your cookie data, the data you're sending back, you have to say which event you're sending back. Mm-hmm. Well, you're saying you're sending back a purchase. Well, guess what? You also send back with that purchase, what that purchase was. Mm-hmm. So you're telling Facebook, Hey, this person purchased, um, some soccer shoes. Okay. Well, guess what? Every single other company that's also sending back a purchase of a soccer shoe. Now Facebook knows every single person that's ever purchased a soccer shoe on Facebook. Amazing. or from a Facebook ad and you get to benefit from it. So that's yeah. why every new company could come along and be like, Hey, like Ian, let's, let's go and create a new, like, um, you know, widget and let's sell it on Facebook. Well, guess what? Facebook already has like a million people sitting there that they know purchased that widget before. Yeah. And so when you show an ad within a thousand dollars or within a hundred dollars, they're already showing you to the people that they know are likely to buy it. Cause the thing that when all the LTV modeling I ever did, you know, the, the number one thing and, and data analytics I've worked with at Lyft and, and um, at Rocket, like the only thing that tells you whether somebody is a purchaser or not is if they purchased it in the past. Hmm. Like that is the, that's the, that's the only thing that's like fully correlated. All the other stuff's like, eh, maybe mm-hmm. like there's something there, but it's not like fully correlated. So it's like, you know, you, if somebody purchased a soccer shoe before, they're likely to purchase this another soccer shoe on, on Facebook again, you know? Mm-hmm. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. And so they lost all that ability. When, when iOS 14.5 happened, guess what happened? You lost the ability to benefit from everybody else. Mm-hmm. So before we were all benefiting from each other, every advertiser was benefiting from each other. After iOS 14.5, we're not benefiting from each other. So when we advertise a class or a product, um, that's, you know, let's say that same soccer shoe, you have to show to a thousand people and then they go, okay, cool. This one person bought that shoe. Okay. What is that person's profile like? Okay, let's try and show more people that look like this person. Whereas before it would just be like, no, we already know the million people. Let's just show ads to them. Right. Yeah, it makes sense. What a powerful position to be in, honestly. So, yeah. <laughs> that's crazy. That's what I mean, that's the same thing as what DSPs were in for the mobile side. Mm. They would know exactly who, you know, purchased um, in a certain type of app, which then would the next advertiser that came along, you know, they would know um, that they should show this person an ad. So. That's crazy. Yeah. yeah. So, so you mentioned moving into web three, for instance, and um, I'd love to revisit some stuff in masterclass, but I, I also want to make sure that we touch on what you're doing right now, because this is yeah. s- super interesting stuff. And so tell me, tell me what you're doing at perfect storm. Yeah. On there? So I'll say like marketing super fun for me. It got to the point where, I wanted to like lead things outside of marketing. I wanted to mm-hmm. kind of help like build teams, build companies. And I love marketing, but in a lot of ways, like every year it kept, I kept getting better and better. And I got to this point where I was like, yeah, I think I'm, think I'm there. I think I, I think I know enough. I'm, I want to try and help empower more people to like get better and whatnot. So I said, okay, I need to do more. And um, the thing that really struck me with Bill, the founder of Perfect Storm was that, we both aligned around our personal vision or mission in life, which is contributing to others' lives mm-hmm. and helping people. 
And you could talk about Maslow's, Maslow's hierarchy. I've been fortunate enough that I've been at companies that have done well and I've contributed to those and um, I've helped other people. And I'd say the one thing that sticks with me is that I'm the most passionate about is when I see that somebody I hired or somebody that I gave the skills of marketing or they helped them and I empowered them, like seeing them go and take their careers where they're doing super well in other companies now or doing well in the company that I was at. And it just, it's the one thing that lasts. It's that feeling of joy that lasts. You buy a new car that doesn't last you, but you help somebody like that change their life. And now they're supporting a family. Like that's amazing. It feels, it, it doesn't go away. And sure. so at perfect storm, what I believe is I played, grew up playing uh, sports and then like played four sports, went and played on the national team for water polo. And what I see happening today is a trend around um, kids aren't being able to play sports at the same rate as they used to because of money. Mm -hmm. Um, sports have been prior privatized. Um, your local communities don't necessarily run sports like they used to when we grew up. Mm -hmm. And as a result, kids aren't getting organized coaching. They aren't getting organized help. And so what I believe we need to be doing is we need to actually give people space to have that growth and mentorship. And what I think that is, is that it's like esports, it's gaming, it's online. We all grew up playing games. Yeah. But we play those games for fun. Well, there's no reason why those games couldn't have been organized or had some mentorship in it. Mm -hmm. And so what I believe we're, we can do is really like take a lot of the benefits that you get from organized sports and co with coaches and, and practices and leadership skills and teamwork skills and actually transfer that into the online space so that every kid that's growing up um, can still can can get all the benefits um, of like organized sports within within online games. That's oh, super interesting. I mean, and the reason the reason blockchain is important there is because mm -hmm. you want to be able to make it a global product. Yeah. And without blockchain, it's really hard to pay people. It's really hard to have people invested in the in the in the product. So um, the other piece is like if you live in a community and every single person there is a renter, mm -hmm. they don't necessarily take care of the community. They don't love the community. They don't you know take pride in it. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you make everybody um, some type of owner in the utility of the, of the community, it makes it um, a place where like people invest their time and energy into the community. So that's why we were, we're looking at it as a blockchain opportunity. Okay. Can you, so can you walk me through that just in terms of how, how just give us a, like a beginner level understanding mm -hmm. of like what blockchain is and how it fits into what you're doing at first. Yeah. So one of the big problems today is that um, with the gaming industry or with any product, right? You, you take a bunch of money from investors. Um, you go and create a product and you sell it. Um, with the games, the same way you take a bunch of money from investors, you go and build it and you sell it. Well, guess what happens? Um, players or buyers of the product use it, but then who makes all the money investors and the product makers? Mm -hmm. Well, all that's doing is continuing to make the people that have money, more money, mm -hmm. the people that don't have money, keep continue to be left behind. Mm -hmm. um, and so with blockchain, what you have now is an opportunity is similar to like Kickstarter, mm -hmm. right? So with Kickstarter, you can give money to get a product sometime in the future because you uh, want to help that company, like create that product. You believe in their vision. You believe in what they're doing. You believe right. in the product they're making. Well, with blockchain, what you can do is you can actually give people the opportunity to fund the product project through cryptocurrency or a token mm -hmm. and then that makes them an owner in that product which then they could also just sell it before the product's even done mm -hmm. so um but what it does is it makes them more of an more of like an evangelist of that product it makes them more interested in helping out with that product mm -hmm. um and so in a lot of ways like the fcc will say like hey you can't say this um but like in a lot of ways you're um, giving somebody the ability to feel like they're an owner in something. Mm -hmm. And so with like, you're almost giving them an equity stake in the, in the company. Whereas when you, when you give shares in a company, you can't give more than like a thousand people shares. Like right. you can't have that many people on the cap table. It's just not legal. Whereas with blockchain, you can have millions of people have mm -hmm. a token. Um, so what they're, what, what the, the tough part here is like, how do you create a way around making it so that the token is actually a utility within the game? Mm -hmm. So it's not like, Hey, you're getting an equity stake. You're just getting something that's used in the game. And the fact that, you know, the demand for that token gets higher means that it's worth more now. Okay, fine. But there's a balance there that companies haven't figured out yet. Um, and that's why 
that industry is still, you know, still very young, but it, I think there's a lot of opportunity because of the benefit of allowing people that care about the things that you care about, believe what you believe to actually invest in you as a company um, and you as an idea. Mm. Got it. Yeah. What a different, what a serious shift from how things were before. Yeah. I mean, today it's just people that have money invest in things and they make more money. Yeah. Yeah. And now it's people that don't have money can invest a small amount. They say $5, $10 and have the opportunity to now make hundred dollars. And that that's something, you know, and not have it only be the VCs and, you know, the, the, you know, private, the private investors that have a lot of money. You think like, what, are there any good examples of, of other games that are leveraging this kind of approach already? Would you say? Yeah. The, the number one game is definitely Axie Infinity. Um, it's big in the Philippines. They were first. Mm -hmm. They haven't figured out, I think, the, the real economy of the game and how to make, really make it work. So there's still a lot of people trying to figure that out. Um, a lot of companies trying to figure that out. But as an example, like Axie in December um, or last year, Axie made uh, one point, I think it was $1.5 billion dollars. Wow. And so like, you know, it's just a wild amount, um, or that, that industry is worth, you know, so they did 200, I think in December they did 200 million. Um, so, but that industry is just, it's still trying to figure out how to do it, like how to set up your economy so that it's not, um, the growth of it isn't based on more people coming in the growth mm -hmm. of it's based on like fun gameplay mm -hmm. and people wanting to be, be there and play the game. So we, our system is going to be based around, you know, coaching, learning, growing, contributing, mm -hmm. uh, rather than making money, you know, Got money it. is a money is a transaction, but like, it's really about like similar to like, you know, organized sports money's there to like make the organizations work. Yeah. But the real reason people are coaching, the real reason kids are playing, the real reason anybody's playing is to get better, to mm -hmm. potentially go to college or, you know, to go play professionally or mm -hmm. whereas, or to have fun. Um, or learn team skills. I and mean, that's why parents try and sign the kids up and then coaches there because they just love the sport and they just want to give back, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Do you, do you think that, when do you think we're going to see the, the, the highest paid sports person in the world be esports person? We're not far away. <laughs> we really aren't. Um, there's like, I was actually just looking at this the other day. Um, Dota two, as an example, their prize for winning the competition this year is going to be $50 million that gets broken up into like, I think it's 25 for the top team wow. and that's who win who wins it. And each team is five people. So that's 5 million, you know, per player. And then you have on top of that, like whatever sponsorships they have. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we're not, I don't think we're that far away um, from that being the case. Um, you know, all, a lot of the big companies are already starting to sponsor esports. you know, Mercedes, mm -hmm. Shell, mm -hmm. Red Bull, like, some of the big companies, Foot Locker, they're, they're sponsoring these leagues and these teams. And so we're at the infancy, like we're at the very beginning of what something, what, what's going to be very, very big trend. And I think the th biggest thing that's fueling that even more is the fact that like organized physical sports are so much harder to be able to be in today. Yeah. Yeah. They're less accessible and you have to be like, a pro by the time you're like six yeah so it's like otherwise it's like i don't want to play with these people they're like way better than me you know so it just the systems aren't there anymore and so because of that i think like you're already starting to see it like basketball viewership's down mm -hmm. um football viewership's down like hockey i think is one of the only like viewership like sport that's actually growing interesting so, like oh. most sports are actually going down um and so uh, whereas you look at esports and guess what? Every year it goes up by like 10, 20, 50, like 30% in some, some places. That's crazy. I mean, that's ridiculous growth. Yeah. There it's, it's definitely the next, you know, I look at, I've got kids right now and I'm like, I'm looking at them and I know what I went through to play on the national team and it's the competition's getting harder and harder. Yeah. And so I look at my son and he's probably going to be two inches shorter than me. And I'm like, this kid's not going to play water polo in the national team. Mm -hmm. I don't even know if he'll be able to go to college for water polo, even though yeah, I'm hoping he's got some good genes, but like, <laughs> Hey, I look at esports. I'm like, Hey, you know, there's nothing that sets him aside from everybody else that can have a, a phone or a computer to play that, to play that game. You know, it's wild too. I think like they did some, I saw some study where 
um, it's so tied to like um, reaction time, which I think decays when you're 16 or 17 or something. Yeah, when you get older. Yeah. <laughs> yeah it's so so awesome. uh, it's, yeah, that's why I think that there's going to be a whole crop of new, like for us, like not making it so that it's, it's based around fully around reaction time, mm-hmm. basing it more on like strategy and teamwork mm-hmm. um, because then you can have like, you know, people that are pros for 10, 20 years because right. they just like, they're able to wear people down. You know, they can, you can have the Michael Jordans or the LeBron James. He's still playing. He's not as good as he was five years ago, but he's right. still, he's still out there. Um, and so that's because of his physical just ability. But like, you know, there's no reason why you couldn't have that in esports. It's just the games right now are designed to be very quick twitch, like reaction time based and especially all the, the shooter games. So that's another thing is like what Fortnite did really well is they made a game that like parents were okay with their kids playing. Mm-hmm. Um, because it wasn't like gory, you know, right. like right. PUBG, you know. Right. Right. That's wild. And I yeah. I got it. So um I have a few questions. This yeah. so your your involvement in the space is is really interesting to a lot of the people on our in our audience. So I, I just mm-hmm. are you cool with a few just random questions from the crowd sort yeah. of thing? I got sure. especially around the gaming stuff. Um yeah. so in terms of web three, what do you think this is relevancy of VR hardware in, in metaverse type stuff um, and the whole web three gaming industry? Yeah, I think um, if you're familiar with Ray Kurzweil singularity mm-hmm. concept, like I think web three is for VR specifically. I think you're hindered by the hardware um, and the technology abilities of vr so i think it's going to take a little while i don't think you're hindered by like web 3 as like a thing i think it's more hindered by just the hardware and how immersive it really feels um and so i think that we're we're just gonna it's gonna take longer and you're seeing vr grow but it's growing linearly it's on the linear part of the you know growth curve at some Mm -hmm. point it's gonna it's gonna take off i don't i don't know technology wise how long that's gonna take but you could you could plot it out and make a guess um in terms of, and I think that's the thing that's holding back VR. I don't think it's the the Web3 piece. I think the if you look at really what the benefit of Web3, you can say like, what has Web3 been used for in the past year or two? It hasn't been used the right way hmm. uh, in gaming. In gaming, it's been used as a way to, uh, by a lot of companies, to like basically just fund a project that they're going to then figure out what to do with it. Mm-hmm. So Um, what that means is they're like, Hey, I got this Kickstarter. Here's my concept. Here's a white paper. And then a bunch of people like put a bunch of money in, but those gaming companies or the studios, most of those companies were, um, basically trying to make money or crypto companies. And they're like, now they're like, okay, let's go and try and make a game. And you see a lot of the games that they're trying to launch. Like they're just not working because the economies aren't set up properly. Hmm. So now you're seeing a shift of like gaming studios, people that actually have gaming experience coming in saying, how do we do this? And I've been for the past two months we've been doing like research for the past two months and we're like, just, you know, going and going and going and, and seeing like, okay, there are some use cases here that do make sense hmm. for blockchain, but people aren't using this, using it in this way yet. And so we're planning on implementing blockchain in, in a way that, that does make it, um, you know, meaningful. It does make it so that it's, it's point, it's like, it's purposeful. It's there. And one of the biggest things is, um, like as an example, like the reason you use blockchain is if you actually want to have people be able to like earn or pay, pay them for something they do for you or to help the community, et cetera, like it's really hard to pay people in every single country in the world, mm-hmm. like exchange rates and all that. Like yeah. if you see a token, like it's easy. Yeah. So that's one of the biggest reasons why to incorporate that. But then the other piece is, um, is making sure that you, you award tokens and you award uh, NFTs in a way that makes it so it incentivizes the right game behavior and it incentivizes the utility of it, not mm-hmm. the investment of it. Even okay. to the point where like, you don't want people holding on to tokens yeah. because that means that it's an investment. You actually want people using it. Um, so that's, that's another big part that like people aren't really getting right yet. Hmm. Do you think that, so I'm not native in this space at all, um, but I just, I've heard some people talk about situations where people will be paid to play by like web three will enable people being paid to play in some way. Um, 
And I'm just curious, like how, how that could conceivably happen, like what, or if that's maybe just a misunderstanding of what's, you know, what, what yeah. the possibilities might be. So, I mean, in any scenario, right. And we're literally talking about like econ 101 now at this point, or like econ two, it's like, you're basically saying, um, we have this new economy. You can think about like this new verse mm -hmm. and in order for that verse to work, what do you have to have? You have to have money coming in mm -hmm. and you have to have that in order to be able to take money out. Right. So if somebody's going to make money, you're either taking money, you're taking money from somebody else. Mm -hmm. Um, and so the way that like esports works right now, as an example, the money coming into the esports like world is sponsorship money. Mm -hmm. It's uh, the game funding it a little bit or the developers funding it a little bit so that then it creates buzz and it creates uh, awareness for the product and it, and it keeps people coming back. It keeps like, oh man, I used to play water polo. Well, guess what? I, I like watching water polo. It's more likely than I come back and I play again. Mm -hmm. um, and it's even more so the case when it doesn't have a physical need where you can say, oh, cool. That was an awesome match. I'm going to get back together with my buddies and play League of Legends. Um, and so like you have to have an inflow of capital Mm -hmm. The problem today is that, so the answer is yes, people can make money, but that means that somebody else needs to be putting in money. Mm -hmm. And so who are the people putting in money right now? It's new players coming in to buy into the game. Mm -hmm. And then that money is then being used to then like be made by the next people, the people that have already been there, which they're like, well, wait a second, How, that doesn't really work. Like players playing the play, pay, paying the players that came in right before them. That's like, feels like a Ponzi scheme. Yeah, exactly. Uh, <laughs> And so what you have to have is you have to have an inflow of capital from other sources. And so you can do that a number of different ways. One way is you can have people that are playing that are, you know, basically paying the developer in the same way that you buy coins in a regular game. Mm -hmm. And then that developer could just say like, Hey, anybody that's like playing to earn and playing in that way, we're going to pay them out. And so basically you have people that are funding it just based on having fun playing the game. And then these other people that are playing to earn, you're paying them out. Um, based on like them doing the things that you're, you know, you're actually saying, like, if you do this and you get this item and this item, if you want to go and sell it on the open market, you're okay. So the, the issue is like, how do you figure out ways where you can have new net new capital coming in that's sustainable? And the answer is like, there isn't a company yet that I've seen that has figured out a way to do that, where it, it's not feeling like it's just, Hey, people that got in early are making money because now there's people coming in like supporting that. Yeah. And, and one of the terms, like the whole play to earn, it's not really the right term. There was a guy, I don't remember who he was. I was talking to a VC the other day and he said that um, the, the term should really be play and uh, play to own because what you're doing is you're playing and you can get to own your content that you're creating your skin, your heroes, your avatar, Mm -hmm. Um, and whereas right now you don't necessarily own it, it's owned by the developer. Um, cause it's, it's sitting there. It's something you've created that you you've, you've grinded to create, but now you can't necessarily sell it. Got it. Okay. Playing to own. It makes sense. And then that value, it got it. it so got you can it. take that value and you can sell it if you don't want to play it anymore, but right. yeah, I think, um, that's a better, you know, some people are talking about play or earn mm -hmm. you know it's like okay but you know no matter what it needs to be a fun game and then all the other things like you know some of them are doing when to say play or earn that's like you've got coins you can play a nor like a normal game mm -hmm. but you also have um you know crypto tokens that you can earn or, or um nfts that you can earn got it i mean what taking it to just acquiring users for these games what what's the best attribution model or, or just is it the same as you would apply for for master class or for lift um what, yeah yeah what, what are you using to track things like ltv or like the, the purchase path did someone get referred from some super user or f referred all their friends to play with their buddies etc i'm just curious how that's how that's going yeah so we're not we aren't at the stage of acquisition yet but I've done research into this and understanding what people are doing. Um, there are some gaps in ad tech right now. Um, the reason being is that because you're doing a Kickstarter style, <clears throat> I, I actually equate it mostly to like a Kickstarter In Kickstarter, you like advertise this product that you're about to make and you get people to donate to you. Um, and you get their email address basically. And you hope they, you know, and then you give them like content marketing until they actually like, you know, buy. 
Right. Um, and that's similar to this. Um, the difference being is that you're sending people to your Discord or to a website where you're constantly giving them updates on your development of the project. Mm-hmm. And as a like owner of your token, they can also then help you with the development. So instead of them buying a you know uh, rights to the product once you make it in that first batch, like a Kickstarter, you're buying a token, which basically says, hey, I get voter rights or it's like a DAO. It's like I get the ability to like help you guys decide what the product ends up looking like mm-hmm. um, in exchange for this money that I paid, this fiat currency I paid for your token. Um, and so the 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 like acquisition of these customers is something right now that you know the different methods are are i would say akin to you know the early methods of like marketing online where you uh you basically were a lot of it was based on like influencer marketing um a lot of it was based on like you said getting like super users like talk about your product and then market it um, and then also just like search ads, mm-hmm. those were like the the main forms because Facebook wasn't there, you know, YouTube wasn't there. So it was about like content marketing, which is like getting like, you know, said influential people like bloggers, et cetera, to like talk about your product today. It's like streamers, it's Twitch people, it's YouTubers um, to basically, you know, talk about your product. And then also uh, like, there's a lot of spamming of discord, which is like the early days of like advertising people just spam the hell out of craigslist um <laughs> right. so there's a lot of that there's a lot of that going on right now got it and the Thanks. best method hasn't been defined and i think in terms of tooling mm-hmm. a big opportunity is like affiliate marketing um like a share a sale for the like for discord mm-hmm. i'd love if that existed but it mm-hmm. i don't i haven't seen anything like that yet somebody needs to make that huh. um, and it'd probably take an engineer like a week to build and it yeah so just create that create that affiliate marketing tool that every advertiser should use. Mm-hmm. That makes sense. Add that to the list, the shiny object list. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's this awesome. space is going to be like a in the next four years a fifty billion dollar space, like. Um, crypto, crypto or blockchain games. Mm-hmm. Um, that's what the like VCs in the space believe and. You know, and it's because of the benefit that it's like user generate users get to be more included or the gamers get to be more included in the development of the product. Is that, yeah, I'm just curious. So is that what, what, like what got you most excited about, about Perfect Storm? Is that, is it the, the coaching aspect combined, like the Venn diagram, these two things intersect, you've got the sort of your background in professional collegiate organized sports the, the possibility of web three gaming. It's like the, the intersection of those two things. Uh, I mean, I think that'll be the story in like five years for successful. Yeah. But the reality is I joined because Bill, you know, came to me and he said he needed help. Um, and Bill yeah. is the founder of the company and uh, we've been close friends for the last, you know, few years. And, um, and we both believe in the same things, which like we, at the time, the product was different than what it is today. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, at the time when I joined in November, all I knew is that we wanted to help people. I knew Mm -hmm. that we wanted to contribute to others' lives Mm -hmm. and help them grow in ways that allow them to provide for their families and enjoy, you know, enjoy life because they feel more secure. And, you know, one of the things that we both agree with is that like, we just hate the fact that your economic success is largely driven by where you were born and who you were born, like what, who your parents are. And that's just like, that just sucks. Like I hate Mm that. Mm -hmm. Um, And I was lucky enough that my parents moved me to a place where I got a good education and then put me in a sport that I happened to have an amazing coach that helped me thrive. Um, And that changed my life. Um, And, you know, I can tell that most people don't get that opportunity. And so we both believe that. And so that was enough for me. Um, Nice. We both value teamwork. We both value hard work. And we just said, and I said, all right, let's do it. Um, and so at that time we were basically just going to be a blockchain MOBA. And now we've gotten, we've done like a few design iterations and we're, that became a MMO MOBA. And then now it became like a, Hey, maybe this is mostly like a coaching and hmm. training and, and team sport thing. And, 
And so, and so we got all these data points that we're trying to kind of like pull together and the values and the feelings and like, you know, that's what, that's where Bill came up with the, t- the name perfect storm. Mm. It's like, you're trying to live your life based on like, you've got your internal like feelings, you've got like your logic, you've got external things happening. And it's like this storm of all these different things and figuring out how to like bring it all together to something that makes sense and, and is right. Um, is why he, you know, why he called the company perfect storm. Um, cause when you have that, it's amazing. And we all have p- moments in our life where it just kind of comes together. Um, and that's what we're trying to do is, is create a product where it does come together. And, and I would say we're almost there. It's been three months of just like design, iterate, sign, iterate. And I think we're, we're, we're getting really close to what, what, what we're going to actually end up building. Uh, that's amazing. And, and, and so people can go check out perfectstorm.gg. Is that the... Yep. So Perfectstorm.gg. Nice. I've got a pretty funny video on there or a nice. fun video. Um, talk a little bit more about what it's like working here. And we also have another video of one of my teammates and we took a little bit of, I took a little bit of the magic out of the masterclass playbook and made a, made a little trailer. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, take a look. It's, it's a good idea of what it's like. And, you know, we are about to open it up to allow people to like join our discord and stuff. So that's going to be nice. kind of the next step here soon. Nice. And, and one, one, major last question that you just touched on okay what's the what's the magic video video formula for masterclass these successful wildly successful video ads besides having you know a marquee talent on camera yeah. like what what else is there to it would you say um so there is a formula the tough part is everyone's copying it now mm-hmm. <laughs> um the formula I would say is uh, I'll, I'll share the formula, but it's like something you can, you can see if you look at enough of the videos um, is the first five seconds, you have to have something that stops people. Mm-hmm. So it has to be something that is like a statement. That's like, Oh, wow. That's a, something that I should, I should really think about, you know? And so I think the best video that format that does that, in my opinion, is Chris Voss's. Um, he starts with just a line that says, everything in life is a negotiation. You're like, is it? He's like, when you go to Starbucks, it's a negotiation. I'm like, no, is it? No, wait, really? And so you opens with something that's like prerogative, like it, it really gets you thinking. And then um, the next thing you do is you want to go into a like, um, this is who I am. And therefore this is why you should listen to me. Um, and so some people you don't have to do that with because they're like marquee talent. But if you're not, you have to actually say like, this is who I am. This is like a little bit of my story. Um, and this is why like, you should listen to me then. Um, so for me, it would be like, Hey, I guarantee that, you know, you could be doing 30% better with your media buying. And I learned that because I was at Lyft and masterclass and I've spent over half a billion dollars over the past, you know, 10, like eight years doing marketing and performance marketing on Facebook, Google, TV, podcasts, et cetera. Mm-hmm. Um, and then after that, then you want to go into basically like what, what you're going to learn or what this product does for you. Um, and then after that, uh, after you do that piece, you, you want to hit them with like why you should do it now. Um, and then that's pretty much it. It's pretty straightforward, you know, pretty straightforward steps. Um, Love it. One of the one other thing that's nice to throw in there is like uh, some type of like user review mm-hmm. if you have it, or include somebody in there talking about it from like a third party perspective. Uh, but it's pretty straightforward. You just the biggest thing that people most people miss on is that first five seconds. Interesting. Got it. That's like you gotta you gotta sit there and spend hours thinking about what you're gonna do in that first five seconds, and you want to take multiple cuts on it. And mm-hmm. then you want to look at them and you want to be like, okay, this is this one's, and that's going to be, make the difference of whether a video does well or not. So multiple cuts of the same exact content, just getting the best one with the best energy and, and putting uh, it in. No, be actually different lines. Different, different lines. I want to do like testing. different lines and just see like, how did that land? How does it feel? How's that good? Is it a good statement? And even to the point where like you show it to like three or four people, you know, mm-hmm. and just be like, Hey, which one did you like? And like, Oh, I like that one. Like that's, yeah. that's good. And then you go from there and you go. And so like, if you watch my video on, on, uh, on perfect storm, like we're a gaming studio. So what I do, I open up holding a, uh, a game boy. It's a nostalgic thing that people remember. And so they see that and they're like, Oh, I want to, I want to listen to what this guy has to say, you know? 
Um, so it's, it's, and I, I you can want to do that visually and you also want to do that with whatever you're saying. Got it. So, so both senses make sense. Yep. So yeah. Cause cool. people are scrolling they're they're flipping. So they, you want to get them, you want to capture them right there, you know? Got it. Awesome. Um, yeah, Thomas, amazing stuff. Honestly, super, super value packed. I think we're going to get people. Gonna, I already have like 20 things in my head to, to follow nice. through on. So, um, yeah, honestly, really looking forward to our next conversation and, um, yeah, where can people find out more about what it is about you, what it is that you do and just kind of get in touch. Yeah. I mean, the, the big thing we're doing right now is we're just building our team. I mean, we, it's a, it's a very niche thing right now, right? Yeah. Like we're building a, a game that hasn't been built before mm-hmm. a gaming studio and a platform, if you will, for like, you know, the next generation of gaming. I'm, I'm coining it. I'll, this will be the first point at time that I coined it. I'm calling it three sports, three sports. So it's like, it's like esports, but you know, web 3.0 together. So nice. I'm also thinking about calling it sports 3.0 yep. because I think it's like the next generation of sporting and what sports is. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not necessarily physical. It's, it's all these other things. And so I'm, uh, but that's what I'm, I'm going to start calling it either three sports or sports 3.0. Um, but I would say, the best thing that people can do is just, you know, follow along. We're going to start to do some social media updates. And so I'd say follow along on LinkedIn um, Mm -hmm. and connect with me on LinkedIn and um, happy to have conversations. But the biggest thing I'm doing right now is just building the team. So finding the right people for the team. Who are you, what kind of positions are you looking for specifically? Right now it's game designers. Game designers. Got it. Yeah. Which is uh, in the gaming space. They're just as hard to find as everybody's like, yeah, I think it's harder to find than engineers are. (laughs) Wow. Wow. Yeah. I imagine that's like a, that's like a unicorn type position. Unicorn role. And it's yeah. one of those that it's like, you want to find people with experience, but you also want to find people that like love just creating. They're like, mm-hmm. like a very creative role, but also a very technical role at the same time. That's wild. Yeah. Amazing. Well, Thomas, thank you so much. It's awesome. Just hearing everything that you've had to say and being able to yeah. chat and sure. uh, yeah, man, glad, glad you're healthy. Glad the family's healthy. And, (laughs) and, um, yeah, yeah, let's, let's definitely stay in touch and thank you so much for, for being on the, on the, on this recording. Yeah, for sure. Thanks, Ian. All right. So that was our chat with Thomas Hopkins of masterclass doc, formerly of masterclass.com and lift.com. Hope you enjoyed it again, get all the resources and show notes inside of your VidTau app. Just go to vidtow.com. It's free YouTube ad library and discover and track your competitors' best YouTube ads, tracking, I don't know, many, many ads, hundreds of thousands of ads every day. And there we're adding many, many more every day. So find your competitors' ads, track them with vidtow. It's free, vidtow.com. And if you need help, any help with video creatives or scaling your business with video advertising, specifically YouTube, TikTok, go ahead and reach out to us in sepli.com. We've managed over $100 million on YouTube for many of the biggest direct response brands, D2C brands, VC-backed, SaaS, et cetera, et cetera. Just go to insepli.com, set up a free brainstorm chat. We'll walk you through discovering some actionable insights for your business. It's not a sales call. And uh, yeah, look forward to our next episode. So stay tuned. We'll send out an email as soon as we go live. And if you have any requests, anyone you think we should talk to, feel free to reach out info at vidtow.com. And yeah, love to hear your feedback, suggestions, etc. So signing off here, Ian Naj, co-founder of Vidtow. Have a great day and a great week. Thanks for listening.